So, okay, if uh, you welcome everyone, I will present Rasa. Um, uh, she works in the Ministry of Social Security and Labor as an advisor in the horizontal policy and project management because the institutionalization uh, uh, process is now based on the project. Uh, so she is uh, the, one of the experts of this process. And uh, as I know, she's studying also in the university and her thematical ground is the institutionalization process. And she makes now a research, Rasa, uh, correct me if, if I'm not right, but uh, she now makes a research about the impact of those deinstitutionalization uh, changes in all the process. So how the new setting of the services affects the people. So please, Rasa, tell something more about you and start the presentation. Uh, good afternoon. It's a very big ple pleasure for me to... Uh, to talk about our country experience in DI process. Um, yes, I share my presentation. So as uh, Natalia represented me, I work in the ministry and also I am a PhD student um, uh, doing a research about the cooperation about the ministry, municipalities, NGOs, social care institutions, corporations, and the impact doing uh, DI process. So today I'm gonna tell you a brief history of uh, DI in Lithuania and the current context. Um, DI is implemented in Lithuania uh, in the institutions which are under the ministry. Uh, it means that ministry implement the rights and uh, obligations of the owner of these institutions. So we have 34 institutions. In those institutions, we have uh, 6,300 people uh, around uh, uh, 54 percent uh, there are people with mental disabilities, one third uh, people are old age, and one quarter is with several disabilities. Uh, the DI process in Lithuania is implemented in six regions. We have 10 regions in Lithuania, but DI is implemented in six regions because um, DI projects. Um, uh, are implemented in eight of those 34 institutions. So it was our beginning with those eight institutions. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, so you see my second slide, yes, Natalia? Mm -hmm. So the first political will in Lithuania, it was in 2012 when the strategic guidelines for the DI of the children left without parental care and people with disabilities have been developed. So we started with two main groups, the people with disability and without children left without um, parental care. And then in 2014, we made... Um, an action plan for the transition from institutional care to family and community services. There were some points what we have to do, what we have to seek, and how DI have to look in the PNU. In 2017, we, uh, the first group living homes we established in Lithuania, and it's um, a quite important date because I think in Lithuania it was. Uh, one of the first time when people living in institution started to live in the community. And there is a political will that new people with disabilities are no longer admitted to the institutions undergoing restructure, restructuring. So it's both uh, eight institutions. And uh, there are also a political will that uh, uh, after the 2013, it is planned uh, not, uh, not to admit new people to institutions under the ministry. And I forgot to 
say that the average living in one institution in Lithuania, people with disabilities, is about 170. But we have uh, two institutions where lives um, near 400 people. So it's a very big institution. Uh, the AI process was uh, shared in some components. So first of all, we started with the research area. We had both eight institutions and we need to know what people live there, what are their individual needs, what do they want, where do they want to live, and um, with who they want to live. And also in this research area, we had to make the development of methodological descriptions of new community-based services. As I heard from presentation before, you heard about some of these new services. So we had uh, 14 new methodological descriptions. Then we had training area. It's about uh, uh, attitudes change, especially for the staff of social care institutions and um, administration, because uh, it was one research in 2012 in Lithuania that one of the biggest challenge to implement the DI process is the attitudes of uh, social care institution staff. Uh, and also we have uh, um, near 4,000 participants in, those, in this training area. When we had piloting area, I will tell a bit uh, later about it. It's uh, new community-based services. Uh, and the last... Uh, <coughs> Uh, the last step, what we are doing now, we are planning to develop a new infrastructure in the community. So we have uh, two ESF funded, funded projects. One uh, started in 2015 and then last year we pilot uh, five um, new services like sheltering housing, temporary respite for families uh, who are caring for their children, and it's very important preventive uh, service for institutional care. Also, we had the case management, we have uh, a recruitment of assessment and personal assistance. I think about personal assistance, you know, a lot, you know a lot because it is written in the Convention of People with Disability. And when we started with a new project last year, which will end in 2023, and we again are piloting sheltering housing, uh, social workshops, decision-making support, and recruitment with assistance. Uh, as you can see, the, some um, some services are both piloting in both projects. It's because of the amount of service users. For example, in the first project, we had just 22 uh, users, people with disability. And now we are thinking about, uh, I think it's around 200 people. So because we see that it's a good practice and people can live by their own just with a little help. And these green points means that um, these uh, services, they, have, uh, they are regulated now in our law. So it's a um, practice to make continuity, but which would be not only the project, the, the beginning as the end. So we have now a challenge to make a continuity of the services and uh, two of the services are quite new, social workshops and decision-making support, which are uh, about also, what's in English, legal capacity, yeah. Uh, and in infrastructure, what we have. So we have, uh, we are planning five types of infrastructure, financed by, um, 
year to year. It's a social workshops, daily employment, but also includes daycare centers, shelter housing, group living homes, and specialized nursing homes. So, as I told you before, we implement uh, DI process in six regions of Lithuania. So, for uh, all of the regions, we made a six investment projects. Uh, we are cooperating with municipalities, NGOs, and social care institutions. And we saw that the total need uh, for infrastructure is 41 million euro. And we will create uh, 140 objects uh, in the communities, including uh, six for nursing care, eight for uh, 88 for group living homes, independent living homes, and sheltering houses. So we will create 1,048 places for accommodation uh, for people with disabilities living in institutions. It will be 80% and 20% will be for people who now live in a community without any help or uh, some other uh reasons so uh, near 1000 places would be uh, for employment services and for daycare for social workshops uh, and what we have now that 80 percent of municipalities are involved they wanted to to be the part of the di process uh, so another 20% uh, DI is implemented by our social care institutions because some of the municipalities um, didn't want to, to be a part of DI. So also I had to have to mention that for the state budget, we have now uh, 32 uh, group living homes. Five of them are for children. Uh, yeah, so we have some experience also what we have can share about them because uh, another group living homes would be from the European uh, uh, money. So, and the biggest topic, uh, what we can talk now, it's the challenges of DI, what we face now. So first of all, it is the implementation of the United Nation Convention for Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, especially of, of Article 19 uh, about uh, living in a community, uh, living independently, and being uh, included in the, into the community. We have uh, uh, some challenges, but not all participants uh, understand and the uh, convention through human rights model. We still have those who uh, think about medical model. So it's a very big challenge. We have to work with it. Also, we have the risk of trans institutionalization. And this is quite, I think, uh, quite good known in all the countries who are implementing it. DI process and cooperating group living homes and this is about institutional culture um, was made those main features are human depersonalization uh, group care and social distance so we have to invest a lot of energy a lot of money to changing the attitudes of social work specialists also about the community I will talk some points later. Uh, also, we have a problem with involvement of other sectors and sharing the equal, equal responsibilities. Like in Lithuania, I feel that the um, DI process is understand as social security part and uh, healthcare, education, culture, political participation. It's not, uh, they are not uh, part of it so we cannot implement the that what say the convention about the community services and so on also the challenges inclusion of people with disabilities now they are just um, 
um, participating as a service user, but we don't have a national mechanism of involving, involving, um, for involving them. So it's our task to do it, to involve them. Um, also, we have challenge to involve NGOs and municipalities. I told you before about the project continuity and about the municipalities which don't want to be a part of the DI process. And also we have now a very big uh, um, challenge uh, about community resistance. Uh, and it's a quite um, interesting thing because when we uh, bought group living homes from the state, but we could buy we could uh, buy what we want. Uh, like uh, we could buy um, houses in the community. But uh, when we were talking with NGOs, uh, there is a, a, a contract like uh, we cannot uh, invest any more euro to unsuitable, unsuitable uh, um, infrastructure. So what we have, we have suitable infrastructure but we have stigma effect it means that you don't know what is your neighbor what will be your neighbor but you have a, a very big discrimination level so this is one reason of community resistance and also we see that the community wants to be a part of uh, a part of uh, dei process so if we started like ministry, municipalities, NGOs, social care institutions, now we have in the next step to think about how to involve other sectors, how to involve people with disabilities and how to involve communities. So this is, uh, uh, that's all what I want to tell you about. Uh, I think if you would have uh, questions, I could answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rasha. Uh, it was very important for us to get this bird's eye view, this big picture of the deep process in Lithuania. Uh, it's inspiring in many ways. For why? Because obviously being a full member um, in the European uh, Union, you have access to the structural funds, you have access to the ESF, to ERDF, <clears throat> something that Macedonia doesn't have. We have only the external aid support from the European Union, which is significant, but still at a different level from the structural funds per se. Nevertheless, there is a lot to learn. And I would like to, uh, in, in, in view of the value of exchange, I would like to ask uh, my colleague and dear friend, uh, Vladimir Lazovsky, who is the, uh, from the ministry here and the responsible for the institutionalization unit, to give us a very brief presentation of the realities of the institutionalization strategy in uh, Macedonia. So there is this kind of mutual learning and mutual exchange. Vladko, we have the floor. Thank you. I hope it's all fine with the, with the sound. Um, good. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to take part in, in in the virtual study visit, it's not that a pleasure, to be honest, that it is virtual, but okay, we all have to live with it now with the new conditions, but it really is a pleasure to learn from our colleagues from Lithuania, um, because uh, from this brief presentation of the colleague from the ministry, uh, from the Lithuanian ministry, I, I am really glad to see that, that you know, some of the, challenges are actually the same. We could <laughs> literally do the same uh, presentation, but it is very, very encouraging to see that, that, that there are, in certain instances, different approaches have been taken, and it's really encouraging to see uh, your success, guys. So, mm, well done, and it really is an, a great opportunity for us to uh, exchange with you, bearing in mind maybe that we more or less come from a similar background back in the days, but now uh, the countries have gone a different path in the last three decades facing the same challenges. If I may, I would like to 
just briefly, briefly say a few words about the DI process here. Uh, and maybe we will come to see what the, what the similarities are, uh, what the differences are, and where we would, it would be best for us to further exchange. Um, the institutionalization, DI in short, uh, has been a long talk really uh, here in Macedonia. Um, the first efforts were started around the year 2000 with uh, children staying in um, one of the special institutions for uh, children and persons with intellectual disabilities. And they were all moved to, to uh, foster families. And that was the first hiccup. It then, the story got somehow forgotten until 2008 and 9, when again it became pretty, it, it got actualized again. And, and back then, the first national strategy on DI was adopted, and the first supported living units, group homes for adult persons with intellectual disability were established. Some 60 people left the same institution as the children back then. And these group homes, these supported living units, group homes are still operating nowadays. Um, but then that was the second hiccup. And for a, for a few years, not much happened until 2017. Uh, I have to say though, there is one big difference that, oh, at least at, it's my first impression from hearing the colleagues speak. I have to say our level, our rate of institutionalization was much lower. And that goes uh, both for persons with disabilities and also children without parental care. So in total, in 2017, there were slightly less than 500 people and children accommodated in institutions uh, across Macedonia. Uh, that's a pretty lower number from what I could hear from from our colleagues. And, and our largest institution back then had slightly over 200 persons. It was, of course, for persons with intellectual disabilities. Huh? Anyway, in, um, that's when we started a process of participatory development of a DA strategy, a long-term one and a pretty comprehensive one. Uh, it was adopted by the government a year later in 2018. And to cut the long story short, it relies on four main objectives, four main pillars, we tend to call them. One is obviously what is primarily associated with the DI process is that is settlement of users. Um, and according to the strategy, we focused on children first. And I'm very glad to say that by 2019, by the end of 2019, we had no more kids under the age of 18 in the institutions. Uh, we resettled them to the communities. Uh, almost half of them were taken to foster families, uh, and a few of them were uh, successfully returned to the biological families, but we also created a lot of group homes uh, for, for children. And this includes the children who were approximately 20 children with disabilities, 20 to 30 now, I can't remember the exact number, but 20 to 30 children with disabilities, physical and or intellectual, who were placed in institutions. And institutions, they have all been moved to, to uh, a new type of care in the community. The second important aspect of our uh, DI strategy is the transformation of the institutions. And we are now have we have now gone into the detailed planning planning of the transformation of the first institution for persons with intellectual disabilities. And this is exactly why this study visit comes really at the right time for us. Uh, having uh, the chance to see how you guys operate there really is a good guidance for us in trying to transform what, what was and still is a residential institution, a long-term residential institution into a more or less community-based service provider that will cover the same areas as you do, meaning 
uh, professional rehab, uh, a series of daycare services, um, including early identification and early intervention from the earliest of ages, from when a child is born, right? Till the age of six, and then um, a, a gradual, how should I say, uh, then, then a series of day services for children, young adults, youth basically, and adults, uh, adults with persons with disabilities. Um, but anyway, the transformation of the former residential institutions is underway. Uh, we didn't want to close the institutions down exactly for the same reason the colleague has mentioned. There was also, as everywhere, I guess, also here, resistance from staff thinking in the beginning that, that they would lose their jobs, basically, if the, if the users would be sent to the, to the communities. That's why we opted for transformation. We wanted to preserve the resources, the experience, the, the staff, the knowledge that there was in the institutions and transform it to be used for nice, modern community-based services. And this is how I come to the third pillar of our strategy, which is development of community-based services. Um, I think it was already mentioned two years ago, we introduced a new law. Speaking of person, a new law on social protection, which is our main, uh, uh, the main law we operate under. Uh, we've introduced uh, several new types of services. Speaking of persons with disabilities, we've introduced personal assistance and home care and support uh, for persons who live with their biological families. Previously, um, only daycare centers were available uh, for them. Now we are trying to expand it to support the capacities of the biological families to take care of, uh, of their members, family members with disability, because we acknowledge uh, the importance of one living with their own family. Uh, we have also introduced, and we are in the process now, uh, we have legally introduced respite care for the first time and we were supposed to open the first respite care center last year really this corona pandemics the COVID-19 has slowed us down really delayed us in a lot of aspects including this one and I hope I hope we will be able to do it uh, uh, this year but basically now uh, the families for example can to explain it briefly uh, if they have a dependent member of the family, they can rely on the state providing free care up to 15 days within each calendar year for that person, be it in the home where the person lives or in a respite care, care center. So that's generally the, the idea. When I mentioned the new law, I think there is another similarity with you. Maybe we had a bit of a different approach, but... Um, uh, there is, I see this similarity um, of trying to involve municipalities, the local self-government, in the delivery of, of social services. I have to say that social protection, as we call it, the uh, system, the social protection, yeah, the system was previously pretty, was largely uh, under the, the, the auspices, the mandate of the central government. We are now trying, because you can't really speak of community-based services unless you have the involvement of the local authorities. You know, it's, we are a small country, but still planning, designing services, uh, uh, running around every day, it's a lot closer to the local self-government. This is a change. For the local self-government and we we really have to work a lot uh, uh, on on building their capacities to deal with this issue you know local self-governments they have not previously thought of this as their own uh, uh, mandate huh? so we have to help them and we we have annual calls for municipalities uh, for grants from the national budget specifically to develop social services and last year, around, well, uh, more than one quarter of the municipalities in the country 
um, were, were contracted to develop uh, various social services. It is interesting to see that home care and support was the most demanded uh, um, service uh, by far, I say. Uh, and, and this year, in, in early summer, in June, uh, we expect to have the, the, the second call. What we are now trying to do is to help municipalities realize that are uh, other needed services. That is not to say home care is not needed, okay? Don't get me wrong, but we also try to help them uh, uh, realize other social services are needed, in particular those who require accommodation of adult persons with disabilities uh, uh, out of their families huh? and as much closer to independent living as possible. So, uh, yeah, I'll not go into more details. I'll only also add that we are really trying to reform and strengthen fostering because, especially for children, but also our law allows for adult persons with disabilities to live with a foster family. And we uh, we would like to we we are in the process of establishing a couple of uh, foster family support centers that that will work directly with foster families, strengthen them uh, not only when they when they are initially interested to become fosterers and so on, but once they are in the system strengthen them, help them even get specialized. Um, the fourth pillar is prevention of DI. Uh, sorry, prevention of institutionalization. No, no not DI, hopefully not, God not. Um, very briefly, we have introduced moratoria on accepting uh, persons with disabilities into institutions and it has been very strictly followed for the past years, which is why we compared to 2017 with all the resettlements and the moratoria, we have resettled to the community over 40% of the people. We now have uh, around 250 people in three institutions, all adults, all persons with disabilities. This is our next challenge. In brief, of course, this is the main challenge in terms of resettlement, but the struggle to get people become full and active members of their communities in this and in the society, uh, once they resettle, is still ahead of us. And I have to, and I'll finish by saying, I really like the, 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 the information you gave us on, on multidisciplinary approaches and, partnerships and cooperation that you guys use in your work to help people really become active citizens. Sorry for the, for the, for the duration of, of this. And thank you. It was a pleasure to listen to, to our colleagues. Latko, thank you very much for the um, uh, information and the sharing of the experience of the institutionalization. It's really important. The first thing that we will do, I hope, uh, with the agreement uh, of Russia, <clears throat> is that we will send the national this strategy. Um, we will send it to you, and it would be at least uh, at that level we can exchange it. But I have two questions for a colleague from the ministry uh, from the Ministry of Lithuania for Russia. <clears throat> the first question, Russia, is that you said that out uh, eight out of the thirty-four institutions in Lithuania back in 2014, they started a process of not only deinstitutionalizing its uh, members, be it children or adults, but also entering a process of transformation. We would like to hear, what do you thinking about this process? I mean, has it happened? Is it uh, an ongoing? What is your ideas and mainly what is your vision? And that is related to the second question. And it is related to the trans-institutionalization. I want to ask you first, these home units 
that are created. I think you spoke about 84, something like that. Uh, for supported living and independent living are under the responsibility and the mandate of the old institutions. Because some countries in the region, I don't want to mention, in the beginning, they, they took the children and adults from the institutions. They created homes in proximity of localities around where the institutions used to be in order to cater for the staff uh, transfer from institutional care to non-institutional -institution, care. How do we change the mentality of institutionalization of the staff of the institutions that we want to transfer to home living units? How we can prevent institutionalization culture within the uh, independent living and supported living at community level what should be the role of the institutions when they are transformed should they be related to managing the home units or be social providers in terms of services at community level i know there are challenging issues and difficult questions but we would like to have your insights, Russ. Uh, thank you for the question. So first of all, I think that the institutionalization process should start not in the institution, but in a family who care for uh, people with disabilities, children with disabilities or adults. So, so I think this uh, direction is quite good for making uh, DI protests. Uh, but also we have uh, the people living in institutions, which uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have a very higher level of institutionalized people and the COVID situation about uh, deaths in our institutions shows that we have to move people uh, living, to live uh, in a small apartments, in a group living homes, uh, in a independent living homes uh, uh, to stop this uh, uh, pandemic situation. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, as I told you about that, I also made a research, so I will talk about more not from the perspective of from a ministry, but from a perspective of what I saw in my res research. So uh, there is one of the main results that uh, is uh, to build a group living house on bad. Uh, um, or how to say, on negative uh, uh, social care institution administrative uh, attitudes, it's a, it's a very bad decision. But despite of this, now we can see a very um, big change, uh, like um, the staff, it's, uh, he's really changing. He uh, see a new, um, uh, how to say in English? Sorry, a new, a new meaning of of their work. We see uh, a new parts, uh, a new attitudes uh, uh, to people with disabilities, for the people what we were living for twenty years, ten years. So we can see another. So the attitude it's changing. Uh, how did you manage that? <sighs> Can you repeat? How did you manage this attitude change? Um, I don't know. I think it came from a practice and we have to make really, we are, uh, the Ministry of Social Security and Labor are um, implementing the um, convention. So we have to make a very big pressure to municipalities and also for those institutions because the institutions are under the 
the owner of institutions or ministry, so we have a very uh, good connection to make a pressure to save all the stuff that you have to go to learn, to change your attitudes, uh, to change uh, the model, thinking model about this disability, rights, to go through medical uh, to human rights models. And uh, of course, it's not always uh, the same. We have uh, many practices, good and bad. So, so it's a pro process of changing and we are challenging it every day. So we are living with it. And also we have a, a very big challenge uh, to work together with NGOs because NGOs in Lithuania, I think in our, all Europe and also your country, they are very different. Some uh, give uh, uh, services to people with disabilities, some works with the human rights in a national uh, level or, or also with the communities. So uh, the attitudes to the process also are very, very, very different. And uh, uh, as a colleague from the Ministry of Macedonia told uh, about uh, children care, we are also finishing with it, but it doesn't matter group living home or community-based home for, for, for children. In a mass media, it face, uh, it face this etiquette of, etiquette of uh, uh, many institutions, but we are doing everything, but it would be not only the many institutions. And I, and, I, and I also, I don't know how we will start to the next step, because now we have uh, using 2014-2020 ESF, uh, Euro European Union money, and when we will have another from 21 to 27. And I don't know if I think that uh, it can be not the same process. Maybe we will think about not group living homes, but out about more sheltering housing with uh, more help inside because you know also the understanding the convention in the ministry in the our departments also we didn't know convention so well in 2012 when we made strategic guidelines and how we know it uh, today so everything could change and the picture of nowadays can be very different in 2030 when you want not to admit new people Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions maybe from other colleagues? Um, we are reaching um, at a point where we have another half an hour and we could uh, continue with two questions that I definitely have and then go into a kind of, of short evaluation that I would like to involve all of you. But when it comes to uh, final question for ASA, when it comes to uh, prevent the mini institutions, as you call them, which is something that's everywhere in the world, not only in Lithuania and Macedonia, but everywhere in the world, we want to try to avoid, and it's a challenge. In the end of the day, a lot it has to do, and let's be honest with it, in terms of how much we are investing in the end of the day in the service. How much when people, when either adults or children are living in supported or independent living homes have also at local level, what exactly you said, Rasa, and also what Natalia was saying before, the opportunity to have a continuity of care, to go to school if there are children, to go to a service like uh, Valakubi and have a service for decision making, a service for, it's a rebirth. Going out from the institution should have the same basic foundations that we provide to services of people who had an accident and suddenly 
they are disabled. They used to be able-bodied and now they are in a wheelchair. The services provide a rebirth, a relearning of living with these conditions. Going out of the institution for people who have been there, children or adults, 10 years, it's another rebirth that it needs to happen within the home and it needs to happen within the community. And the continuity of service, the daycare, the support, the individual and all that is very important. Rasa, what we saw from Valakopi is that you have invested a lot in having community-based services at local level. Is that the challenge for you to continue in doing? What is the commitment, the political will of the ministry in investing in this process? Um, I don't know if I can full I can full answer to this question, but I think it's very important uh, for us and also for for the ministry to invest to the uh, NGOs and to community based service. But we just have um, not to forget. Uh, uh, to involve uh, people with disabilities to whole sectors that we would be not uh, how to say all the time to infrastructure what is only for them like daycare centers or sheltered work workshops so also we have a different uh, meaning now for sheltering workshops but it could be not only the place where people made some uh, uh, some things, uh, but we also, when we do things, uh, we are selling it, so there's a connection to the community, we are seeing where attitudes are changing little by little, so, um, and I think that uh, organizations like Valakope are very, um, very important, and we are, have to invest to it because uh, it's not only about some DI uh, services, it's also about uh, another systems, what we can uh, give to the ministry and then the ministry to make it uh, as a political will. So it's also about the quality of services. It's a voice of people of, with disabilities. So it's uh, much more than, uh, than just investment to uh, some services or to infrastructure. I don't know if I answer it, I hope. I can hear you. Maria, the microphone. Uh, yes, of course you answered and thank you very much. I mean, it's exactly this process. A colleague, Michaela, is asking, uh, in your, something that I asked before really reinforcing this question, what are you, what is your vision for transforming these institutions? What do you want to do with them? What are you going to do with them? You are asking like the representative of the ministry or? Sorry, may I say something? Hello, I am Michaela. Uh, so my question referred to what is what is happening with the buildings, with the premises of the former institutions? Are you using these premises or buildings for uh, for setting up other social services or, I don't know, educational services? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I understand now. So uh, we, we will uh, implement this uh, first project and we will move uh, both eight institutions, uh, people from those eight institutions until 2023. And what would the those uh, buildings, uh, um, uh, Natalia, could you help me to translate this one word, Dvaray, uh, Dvaras? Oh, Jesus, it's, uh, uh, most yeah. of them were historical buildings of the uh, dukes uh, in Lithuania. So it's historical where they um, uh, established the care homes. 
Yes. So these are historical heritage. Yes, Rasa? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, we are just thinking uh, to give it uh, to our cultural sector of if it's a very bad, um, uh, bad infrastructure just to give for, uh, we have in Lithuania, um, Torto Bankas. Um, Immobility Bank? of the government, like the state immobility bank. Okay. So that is all the immobility which, uh, um, which the state owns. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So you are not going to use these buildings uh, for setting up, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, daycare centers or respite centers or uh, recovery centers. Mm -hmm. We are very far away from the community. Yes, I t it's, as Natalia told, it's, uh, I can call it castle, but it's very far away. It's not in the community. And the okay. uh, yeah, and infrastructure is very bad. Uh, as I told you before, we also will create some nursery centers, which are a little bit bigger, but uh, we were thinking about maybe to make in both institutions, but they are not suitable anymore. Uh, okay. Honestly, I'm really happy I'm not suitable anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Zdravo, jaz sem Dimitar. O delu od ona, što sakaš, da go prašam, vek je beše pokrijeno od Marije, znači ta beše pomrza od mene. A ne li, dokoliko postoji proces na deinstitucionalizacija, potrebna je i sodvetna ramka za tretman vo zajednicata na tije lica. Me interesira, kakva je vključenosta na državnite institucije vo celijo toj proces, da li ti imaat koordinatori, go navljuduvaat procesot, i kakva je ulogata na semestoto, ko kak del od licata koji što izlegovaat od institucije, se vraćaat nazad vo nimnite semestva, a i kako vidite nekako na poddrška od semestvata i od lokalnata zajednica dobiva v procesu na rehabilitacija. Vi blagodajte. Kot someone translate? We understood a little bit, but not everything. What, there is no translation? Uh, Excuse me, I was under the impression that the there is an automatic translation. The translator will repeat the question of Dimitar. Should we switch to some other channel because we don't hear the English, English channel in interpretation? The English channel. English. Yes, we hear Rasa. Did you switch? Yes. Yes. Please, please repeat the question. Значи вака, моето прашање беше Pa vo pogled na tretmanot vo zajednicata, dokoliko postoji proces na deinstitucionalizacija, isto taka, nako mora ako da postoji sodvetna ramka za tretman na tije lica vo zajednicata. Do you have a translation now? Ok. Excuse me. So what is the legal framework and the role of the government of the public institutions in the process of the treatment within the community and also what is the role of the families of, of, the, of the people who... And what is the role... And what is the role of the families of the people who used to be uh, institutionalized, uh, how much of them, which percent uh, goes back to their original families and what kind of support in reality, in practice, do they give to the former patients? Thank you very much. 
thank you. I will try to answer. Uh, I don't know. I think that if we talk about children with disabilities, uh, there are some uh, maybe good practices when children go to live to the family, uh, but it goes to the other direction of the eye, as I told you, children left without parent care, parent and care. And uh, I cannot uh, say this about adult with disability. I think that we in Lithuania, we have just a few and it's just um, kind of good luck. Um, both people in, in institutions we have that uh, I know about 60% of people with disabilities went to institutions until 2007. 2007. So it's uh, 14 years right where you are living in institutions with 60% or, or, more, or much more because from the birth we, are, we were going from one institution to another, from children to adult to special schools. So there are no any connections with any family members. But in Lithuania now we have a, a very impressive or a very big voice of mothers who are caring with their children with disability in, Lithu in, in their house. We are very, uh, it's like a movement and we are talking about the rights, about services they need. So, for example, in our uh, uh, new political, uh, new political uh, team, we have uh, some commitments to make a temporary respite, to make a personal assistance and some other services. So it's Sad to say, but people with disabilities who are living in institutions, they don't have any connections, I think, because also uh, Lankimas. Yeah, you know Lanko, Visit? Right? Yeah, when, because of family members, we are not visiting. As I told you, we are very far away and we, we don't have any connections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rasha. And thank you to everybody, to all the speakers. We are now at the point where <clears throat> we are reaching the end of the first day. And there are two things that uh, I would like to, to say at, at this level. First of all, uh, it, it was um, really impressive, your, the participation that we had. And I'm very happy for that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please stay for the next five minutes. Ah, uh, Risto Angelov wants to have a question. Am I right? And Rita also. Yes, sorry. Okay, please take the floor. Do we have again to change the interpretation? Yeah. Yes. Give me a minute, please. So, uh, we have a question from our colleague from the ministry, Drita, and she is asking. Is, uh, uh, shall I translate it? It will be easier. Uh, Drita is asking whether the process, um, uh, as a part of the deinstitutionalization process that you have passed, can you uh, stress out one or several type of mistake that you or challenges that you face so that can help in Macedonia the process of the institutionalization in terms of not making the same mistakes that you made it? Uh, yes, thank you for the questions. So. Uh, 
I think one of the main challenges that we have to do different and we will do different now it's uh, we're sharing the uh, uh, DI process with other sectors because uh, yeah when we do it only in social security uh, uh, system it's uh, not a good practice of DI and uh, I think that the DI, uh, the meaning of DI in uh, post socialist countries, it have a very, um, not very good the term of uh, DI, what, what DI means. DI means what is written in the convention under Article 19, but how many participants of DI understand it, it's like uh, closing those big institutions to the smaller. So the changing attitude to everyone is also a very, very big challenge. And uh, uh, maybe to, to start from the other, other side or to find a cooperation because we started from institutions just to want to lift people to the community. But uh, it's interesting what would be, and we have a, a very known uh, professor uh, in Lithuania who are working with this topic and he just say not to um, build with new institutions, new institutions, it doesn't matter, it's a good or bad practice, but to start from the families uh, who are caring people with disabilities. So it must be much more attention to this topic. But did you face some a particular mistake? Did you make something that uh, most probably from this point of view, you would make it differently, some concrete uh, mistakes. Natalia, do you want to ask something? Yes, or we gave a lot of time to the DI process, which we now have to be able to make it easier. Or we gave a lot of time to the main thing, so we now have to be able to make it easier, or we gave a So I just asked Natalia if I understood good, uh, and um, I think what I said, uh, it was our mistakes. So we have to take, uh, because we will inter implement it for another 10 years, or lit a little bit uh, less, we have changed a little bit uh, direction. And uh, yeah, we are planning to do it. We have a, we have a new discourse of what community must be. And you know, we're starting to create a, a group of living homes uh, before five, 50 years in a world, it looked like a best practice, but now I've, everything changed. But uh, in different countries, this attitude is very different. So um, in some countries, it started, uh, they are not building anymore. Uh, some countries are making this new attitude to make uh, a, a team, uh, to make a team, a good team who cannot, who can create not a mini institution, but who can create a new, a, a, and uh, good homes for people with disability. Uh, so not all the homes are, de are the same. It very depends on the community. It depends on the social workers. It depends on community resistance because if there is a big resistance on social workers, uh, we can be afraid to go uh, outside. So it's a very big difference between uh, community placed and community based. So it's everything about the attitude and working. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think you've said the magic words. It is different to talk about community placed services and community based services a huge qualitative difference. And yes, it is a learning process for 
both countries, for our countries. Um, we are learning. We are learning from best practices, but also from mistakes to avoid. Each country has its idiosyncrasies and its uh, specificities, but it is good that there are two countries with, in terms of population, in terms of ex previous experience, we are, we are very close to each other. And uh, I'm very happy for today's uh, meeting. I'm not saying that because we organize it. But honestly, I think it was a learning process for all of us. Um, we learned a lot about the function of, of the center and the basic of the services. The second uh, day, we will specify and we will have a specific focus um, discussion about two services, about rehabilitation services and about um, also supporting decision making this is something very very important for us we have about 10 minutes to utilize for evaluating and lessons learned we are looking forward to your comments now because this is also a new experience from us for us for all of us including us so we want to learn from you what can we do better was it something uh, this this first day what you were expecting, it met your expectations. Uh, we would like to have more contributions, maybe your questions sent to us. But honestly, we would like some evaluation at this stage. It is important for us so we can be better and better. Thank you very much. You can write in the chat, you can give us your, your views, uh, taking the, the, the floor, please. Excellent work, Maria. Well done for organizing this uh, study visit. It was really useful to hear the experiences from the EU member state countries and to make a comparison about the processes in the both countries. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much. Okay. I take it that uh, the fact that we have 53 people remaining at, uh, after almost four hours indicates that uh, there was a lot of interest. We are looking forward to have you with us in the second day. It's going to be on the 20th of April in six days from now. It is going to be next Tuesday. The same pattern will apply. We will send you all the presentations today from everybody. Of course, uh, we will uh, send uh, in English and then we will translate it and send it the soon as possible also in Macedonia. We will um, invite you in our Facebook page, the Virtual Study Visit Facebook page, to discuss and exchange ideas and questions. Specifically, next uh, second day, when we will be discussing about all these services, the ser specifically looking internally in the services, I'm sure that there will be a lot of interest and a lot of questions. So please follow us on, on, on Facebook and we will be giving ideas and we will be sharing. Um, thank you very much for your participation. Write your comments to us, whatever you want to write. Please, if good or bad, give us feedback because we need it in order to improve. It was a pleasure to have you all. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you for being here. And we'll see each other on the 20th. Uh, in the second visit. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Rasa. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Dusan. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, all of you who have been here. Thank you, Valentina. From Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Dayan. So nice to see you all. Thank you very, very much, all of you. See you in uh, six days. Thank you, and see you next week. See you next week. The sixth day. The sixth day. Please. Please.
а, ви, а, ви благодарим за ова студиска виртуелна посета. Имаше мощни корисни информации за нас, а, а исто така и за моите колеги кои што работат со мене во Центарот за професионална рехабилитација. Ние тука работиме во служба за а, професионална рехабилитација и поддршка при вработување. Релативно сме, мислам, можне нови, една година работиме, а со пандемијата ни се, ни се а, некако имахме пречки, знаете, ковид ситуација, но сепак а, осознахме многу интересни информации кои понатака ке ни користат во нашата работа. и ке не насочуваат по секој случај. Thank you, Misha, and your colleagues from the Rehabilitation Center. Next time, it would be an opportunity to exchange information also from our experience from the Rehabilitation Centers and Daycare Centers. I would ask you to think about things that you would like to share. We learn by sharing. 